Welcome to the Retirement Made Easy podcast. I'm your host, Greg Gonzalez. On today's episode, we're going to be talking about the five biggest retirement myths that you've got to hear. Before we get started with myth number one, I wanted to remind listeners, you can check out our website, which is retirementmadeeasypodcast.com retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. There's a few free resources there, such as my retirement secret sauce and also the 2020 tax guide that you'll want to get your hands on. Again, these are free resources. You can also send me emails to greg at retirestl.com. And on the website, there's a way to ask a question for the podcast. So check out our website, retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. You can listen to previous episodes and um, get your hands on those free resources. Let's get started with retirement myth number one. And you've heard this myth hundreds of times. I've heard it probably millions of times, it seems like. And when you hear something so many times, you almost take it to be true. And that's the problem with some of these myths that we're going to discuss. Myth number one says that you will spend 70 to 80 percent of your pre-retirement income in retirement. In other words, if you were if you were still working and you were making a hundred thousand dollars, you would spend seventy thousand to eighty thousand dollars per year in retirement. In other words, you would spend twenty to thirty percent less in retirement. This may be a good starting point for some people, but I cannot tell you how many clients that I have that have been retired for years and years and years, and they spend just as much in retirement as they did when they were working. And I have other clients that spend half as much in retirement as they did when they were working. And for those people, it's maybe they had paid off their house. Maybe they paid off a lot of debt so they can live on a lot less money. I just don't like seeing people use these rule of thumbs or or averages again. uh, When you look at the height of an average person, an average male in the United States, it's five foot nine. And so if we did our shopping based on the average, uh, the the fact that the average male in this country is five foot nine, we would say, okay, we're going to buy our brother, our uncle, our husband, our son, we're going to buy him a size large. Well, I'm six foot one. And I can tell you, I can't fit into a size large. I'm an XL or maybe a Uh, a large tall that might fit for me. Just like the size of your t-shirt has to fit you, your retirement planning has to fit your retirement goals that you have with your family. What's so unique about retirement planning is it, like, like I said, it is so personalized. The goals that you have, maybe with your spouse, maybe with your family, you might say in retirement, we want to spend more time with kids and grandkids, and we want to be more charitable. We want to spend more time on hobbies and and traveling. That's the first step is to determine, to write down what those goals are, what those retirement dreams are. And then next, you want to quantify those goals. They say the secret to success is figure out what makes you happy, write those goals down, and then make them come true. Then put a plan together to make those goals a reality. That's the first step. Again, you can't go off of some law of average that that works for the the mass quantities of people out there or might work. You want to go off of planning something so important as retirement, which retirement planning, imagine you're writing a book and your life is a book. In retirement, you're writing the last four chapters of your life. You're the author of your life. How do you want those last four chapters of your life, of your book, to read. You get to, you get to plan ahead. You've got the pen in your hand, and you're, you're planning for the best years of your life, which are ahead. What I see some people do is even put in a little bit of a cushion. So what they will do is they will say, hey, we think we're going to spend $6,000 a month or $7,000 a month in retirement, But in case we end up spending more, we want to have a little bit of a cushion there of, say, $500 to $1,000 a month in case we end up spending a little bit more. Personally, I really like that idea because it's a conservative approach that allows you room for error. So that's something that you might consider for your own plan. 
Retirement myth number two, and you hear this all the time, your taxes will be lower in retirement. Really? Unless you have a crystal ball, it is very, very difficult to say to everybody across the board that your taxes will be lower in retirement. And the reason being is because we do not know what the tax bills, the tax codes are going to be in the future. The current tax code that we're under is the Trump tax bill, which is going to, it's set to sunset in 20 year 2025. So this is not going to go on forever. So this tax environment is certainly going to change in your lifetime. And when we look at a retirement of 30 years, it's probably going to change multiple times. So for most people, we cannot say confidently that your taxes are going to be lower in retirement. It would certainly be a lot easier to plan from a tax standpoint if we knew what the, ta the tax codes were going to be over the next 30 years. But we'll ju we're just going to have to wait and see. I've heard many people give their opinion that taxes are going to be higher in the future simply because the federal deficit is at monumental levels at this point, and the same people believe the only way you're going to pay down the federal deficit is by increasing federal income taxes. That is a whole nother topic for another day, um, but certainly an interesting debate. Let's next talk, talk about state income taxes in retirement. This, I believe, you could make a better argument that taxes could be lower for you in retirement than they are when you are working. And what I mean by this is, for example, let's look at so Social Security. Currently, right now, there's only 13 states that tax Social Security. And not at all income levels are, are they taxed. Missouri, for example, um, they tax Social Security. They're, Missouri's one of 13 states that taxes Social Security, but only those above certain income levels, income thresholds, so to speak. And there's 12 other states. Illinois, for example, Illinois is a extremely tax-friendly state. So if you live in Illinois, they don't tax your Social Security, they don't tax your pension, and they also don't tax your IRA withdrawals or your 401k or 403b withdrawals either. So Illinois is an extremely great place to live if you're a retiree from a tax standpoint. However, Illinois is, I believe, number two. I was reading an article from Forbes in January. As far as property taxes, Illinois has the second highest property taxes of, uh, of any state in the country. Um, New Jersey was number one on the list. Another interesting point to make is that many people will retire to Texas or retire to Florida. And one of those reasons, I guess one of the benefits of, of Florida, for example, is they have no state income tax. So it is a great place for retirees that live down in Florida. If you live down there more than six months a year, you qualify as a Florida resident and you are exempt from state income taxes. So that's a pretty big deal. So depending on the state in which you are going to be living in retirement, you could certainly make the argument that state income taxes in retirement are going to be lower for you. I would definitely agree with that. I see that over and over again, especially for those folks that uh, want to move down to Florida or maybe Texas. Getting back to federal income taxes in retirement, I will say that that typically when we see someone with a you know a good sized pension and they're taking the the monthly pension option, and then they combine that with their social security and any 401k or IRA withdrawals, that typically they're they're paying quite a bit of taxes in retirement. In, in fact, it's taxes and health uh, healthcare expenses are the biggest expenses in retirement for sure. Another thing to consider about current day retirees is the fact that Roth IRAs, they were just introduced in 1997, the first year you were eligible to 
contribute to them was 1998. So they really haven't been around for the entire career of people who are retiring, you know, in 2020 or, or are already retired. So typically what that means is that the balances of Roth 401ks and Roth IRAs is not as large as as IRAs and, and 401ks and 403bs. So what happens is, is that retirees are more heavily weighted on the tax deferred side. So when they get into retirement and they're drawing money out of their retirement nest egg, their retirement accounts, they're, they're being taxed on those tax deferred monies in the regular 401k and the IRA because their, their Roth balances are, are just not as large. So, and it's not their fault. It's again, Roths just came out in uh, 1997 when the law was passed and 98 was the first year you could contribute. So that's another thing to consider about current day retirees. The whole idea with 401ks and IRAs, the, the tax deferred money that you save for retirement is hopefully you're in a higher tax bracket when you're working you defer paying the taxes in the higher brackets. And then upon retiring, when you're in a low bracket, then you start paying the taxes at a low bracket in retirement. However, it doesn't always work that way, uh, but that's certainly the ideal situation. Retirement myth number three is probably the most popular of all the five retirement myths. It states that you should take Social Security right away at age 62 before the pot runs dry. Believe me, I've heard this over and over again from people that are concerned about the solvency of Social Security. The Social Security Administration says that 34% of people claim their benefit right away at age 62, and fully 57% of folks claim their benefit before their full retirement age. Certainly, there's going to be some very significant changes to Social Security to keep the Social Security Trust Fund solvent. Keep in mind, there's 77 million baby boomers, the majority of which are counting on that Social Security retirement benefit. So I have personally have faith that solutions will be put into place. And Social Security will be there for people. So don't, you know, my suggestion is don't base your decision on when to claim your Social Security benefit based on the money not being there. In other words, the solvency of Social Security. There are bigger factors that determine when someone should really claim their Social Security benefit. Let's talk about those. First off, for those folks that want to claim their benefit prior to their full retirement age, I want you to look at what is your predicted employment income during that period when you're under your full retirement age. What a lot of people don't understand is, is if you claim your benefit right away at 62, while you're still employed, you might be giving up some of your social security because of an income restriction that the Social Security Administration has in place for those that are working while collecting their benefit below their full retirement age. So keep that in mind. Next, you should consider your current financial condition. And what I mean by that is you have to take a look at your current situation to determine if you can afford to delay your Social Security retirement benefit. Next, you want to consider your health. Social Security is one of those things where you have to be around to collect or your spouse has to be around for their survivor benefit. So consider your health and your spouse's health in your Social Security decision making. Next, you'll want to consider your other resources, such as maybe a, a pension benefit. Maybe it's a 401k or 403b or other retirement accounts that you might have. I met a couple once and their plan was to liquidate and spend through all of their retirement nest egg, their 401k and Roth IRAs. So at the end of the day, when they turn 70, they could live strictly on their social security and all their retirement assets would be spent down. To me, that wasn't the best plan because then you lack liquidity. So keep in mind the your other resources outside of social security should factor into your social security decision. 
Lastly, you want to look at your marital status. Are you single? Are you divorced? Or are you married? If you're divorced, you may be able to claim your, your ex-spouse's spousal benefit, depending on how long you were married. If you're married currently, you want to look at the age gap between you and your spouse, and also the gap between each of your Social Security retirement benefits. Some couples have a goal of maximizing the survivor benefit, which protects the last spouse standing. Let's jump to myth number four. Myth number four, you've probably heard all the time or read it in magazines that says, you need a million dollars saved for retirement before you can afford to retire. In fact, I have had quite a few people say that they believed they would never be able to afford to retire because they would never get to that $1 million finish line. Let's first look at the people who might be able to retire on less than a million dollars. Imagine someone has a, a very high corporate pension and they elect the, the monthly pension option. Let's say it's seventy or $80,000. Well, they may not have as much saved in their retirement nest egg because they're depending on this big pension to support their lifestyle in retirement. Next, consider somebody who's completely debt-free. They've got their house paid off. They've got no car loans, no credit card loans, no boat loans, or anything like that. So they can live on less in retirement because they're debt-free. And therefore, maybe they don't need a million dollars to draw from as far as a retirement nest egg to support their lifestyle. I'm going to go one step further and say that this same retired couple has financially independent adult children, meaning they don't have to intervene financially in their adult children's lives. And lastly, if the same retired couple had very high social security benefits, maybe they had two very long careers and their social security benefits were over $2,000 a month each, then they probably don't need as big of a retirement nest egg to draw from in retirement. So you might say the bigger a couple's social security benefits and pension benefits, the less they need in retirement accounts to draw from in retirement because their retirement income is coming from the social security benefits and the pension benefits. That's another way of looking at it. It really all comes down to how much you want to spend in retirement. So if you have big dreams for retirement and big aspirations, maybe it's traveling, maybe it's um, helping pay for the grandkids' college educations and weddings and, and all kinds of s sorts of things like that, then yeah, you may need well over a million dollars to support that lifestyle that you, that you dream of. If you live in California, you may need a bigger nest egg than someone who lives in, a, in say, the Midwest. In, I'm doing this podcast in St. Louis, Missouri, where the cost of living is a lot lower than it is in California. It all boils down to the lifestyle that you want to live in retirement. If you want to live a very modest lifestyle in retirement, then yeah, you, you might not need $1 million in your retirement nest egg to live comfortably the way you want to live. This $1 million milestone that has been proclaimed for all these years really disheartens a lot of people. And it makes people feel like they'll never get there. So depending on your circumstances and your own personal retirement dreams, you may or may not need a million dollars saved. The last of the five great retirement myths is this notion that retirement is an end for people. And it, it couldn't be farther from the truth. And what I mean by an end, an end of career, and basically you're just going to be sitting on the couch and living a life of of no meaning. What we are, in reality, what we're really seeing is retirees are very, very active in working part-time, in doing consulting work, in starting small businesses, in volunteering. Retirees are, especially this generation of retirees, are the most active we have ever seen in the history of the world. So the notion that retirement means an end of something couldn't be further from the truth. 
What we're seeing is people are retiring instead of from something, they're retiring to something. And if you look at what people are jumping into, it, it's things that, that give them joy, that, that they're passionate about, that is fulfilling to their lives. Because in retirement, you get to choose how you spend your time because you have time on your side. In fact, I would encourage everyone to figure out what they're most passionate about. And if they could ask themselves, if, if they could do anything, regardless of pay or, or whatever it brought them financially, what would they do? What would bring them the biggest joy in their life? Maybe it's their, their current work, but a lot of times it's, you know, starting a small business or maybe it's, uh, you know, turning a hobby into a small business venture or, or working part-time somewhere. For many people, retirement marks a new beginning, and it can be the best thing that ever happened to you. That's it for this week's show. I hope you enjoyed the five biggest retirement myths. You can check us out online at retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. That's retirementmadeeasypodcast.com. You can find our retirement secret sauce on our website, as well as our 2020 tax summary. We will catch you next time on the Retirement Made Easy podcast. And before we go, remember, always dream big. The opinions voiced in this material are for general information only and are not intended to provide specific advice or recommendations for any individual. All performance reference is historical and is no guarantee of future results. All indices are unmanaged and may not be invested into directly. Securities and advisory services offered through LPL Financial, a registered investment advisor, member of FINRA, SIPC.